Bearing his father's name and his mother's resolute temperament, William Seaton, the eldest son of Mother Seaton, has a story of his own. His story, often eclipsed by his mother's legacy, is marked with spiritual obedience, suffering, and a patriotism for the newly formed United States of America. And as the son of a saint, one can't help but wonder at their relationship. Their stories are more similar than one might imagine, and for both mother and son, the sea was consequential in both of their lives. And that is where we begin. Elizabeth loved the fresh breeze provided by the shore from a young age. She would sit alone by the water's side and spend hours wandering the shore, singing and gathering shells. But she was mourning the loss of her mother and baby sister. Her son William would also endure the loss of a parent at the age of six. William's father, a shipping merchant, died in Italy when the mild climate of the Italian seaside failed to provide the remedy for his battle with tuberculosis. His father's last hope had been the sea, and it had failed him. Returning home from Italy after the death of her husband, Elizabeth wrote, A heavy storm of thunder and lightning at midnight, the dust shaking at the terrors of its almighty judge, a helpless child clinging to the mercy of its tender father, the soul at sea through every pain and sorrow. Left behind with his younger siblings in Manhattan, William became familiar with his uncle Henry Seaton, a lieutenant in the young United States Navy. This was likely when William's fascination to a life of service at sea took root. Upon Elizabeth's return, she introduced her newfound faith to her children. William quickly desired to serve at the altar, sharing, I would rather be an altar boy, Mama, than the richest, greatest man in the whole world. To Elizabeth's delight, he aspired to be a priest in the years that followed. When Elizabeth moved her five children to Emmitsburg, Maryland, her sons attended Mount St. Mary Seminary and rambled over the hills and valleys at the foot of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Later in life, William called himself a true mountain boy. But despite the bucolic charm of the country, Death soon revisited the family, this time nearly claiming 13-year-old William and coming so close that a burial shroud was made for him. He survived. Soon after, however, his younger sister Anna Maria was not as fortunate. William was experiencing the same grief of losing a sibling as his mother did years prior. While he recovered and mourned the loss of his sister, William read about adventures on the ocean, and his childlike zeal for the faith began to wane as a new ambition took root. Elizabeth wrote how he often talked about saving the world. William began to crave the sea, and as his boyish dreams became ambitions, fear began to claw at Elizabeth's heart. She wrote, My greatest anxiety is for my boys. By this time, the War of 1812 had begun, and William was now 16 years old and vocal about his desire to join the Navy. The war wreaked havoc less than 100 miles away in Washington, D.C., where the British gained control of the capital and burnt the White House to the ground. The war likely stoked William's patriotism and desire for adventure. It equally stoked Elizabeth's concerns as she wrestled with how to guide William's discernment. She tried coaxing William into becoming a shipping merchant like his father by sending him to apprentice in Italy. But he was very unhappy there. She eventually resolved to support him in his pursuit of a naval career. Through the parents of her students, she used her connections to obtain a commission for William going so far as to appealing directly to the President of the United States, John Quincy Adams. 
I have released him from his prison of obedience. William joined the Navy on July 4th, 1817 and left his mother. Elizabeth wrote, My William, my William, I could write a whole page of only that word, but I must be strong and give you up again and again to God, my dear one. Guard well, my dear one, that pure heart, which will be the charm of our reunion. Look up to the pure heavens in your night watch, and you will hear what that soul would say to you. Her concerns about his spiritual welfare deepened alongside her worries about his safety. Her fears were well placed. News from friends reported William slipping further away from the faith. With little to no access to the sacraments on a ship, Elizabeth worried about him losing the faith entirely. An extraordinary number of letters exist from this time, with Elizabeth composing up to three letters a week to William. The majority of the correspondence was from mother to son. In one letter, Elizabeth wrote that when she woke in the night, she believed it was his angel that woke her to pray for him, and she would find herself dropping off to sleep, repeating his name again and again. William did not always write back, which further exasperated his mother. Over the following decade, William would rise to become a lieutenant in the Navy. Eventually, he would understand the anxieties of waiting for news from a loved one. On June 19, 1821, William wrote, My beloved mother, you may imagine how anxiously I wait your first lines. The last I received from you was dated May, one year more and back. Do write quick and let me know how you are. A response would never come. Elizabeth had died six months prior on January 4th, 1821, with just one of her five children at her side. Elizabeth would truly rest in peace, knowing that in time, William fully embraced the faith. And not only did he embrace it, he passed it on to his eight children. His daughter, Helen, became a sister of mercy, and his son Robert became an archbishop and papal official. Like his mother, William experienced tragedy and hardship throughout his life, but his love for God was only strengthened with time. Late in life, he would reflect in a letter to his sister how heaven had truly been good to us. He passed away in 1868, and as he requested, he was buried near his mother in Emmitsburg, the place he considered home. Elizabeth knows all too well the concerns of a mother, as well as the effort it takes to guide one's child in the right direction. Through her well-placed confidence in the Lord, mothers are given an example of what unwavering faith can do not just for one's own sanctity, but for one's child as well. Because of her struggles as the parent of a sailor, Elizabeth was declared patroness of the sea services. Every October, the annual sea services pilgrimage is held at the National Shrine of St. Elizabeth Ann Seton to pray for those who serve our country and the families that support them. <laughs>